What have been the politics of doing archaeology at this particular site? It's, it's interesting because you have both the involvement of the federal government right. and also native involvement. We also have the involvement of the local Euro-American community. Mm -hmm. very, very. Mm -hmm. Initially, the politics when we were working there in the, in the 90s, or at least we thought they were fairly straightforward, they're fairly simple. Uh, the politics of, of working on the site, well actually, um, I'll give you an example. I think I'll give you a, I mean, can I give you an example of the politics? Okay. We're in the process right now of trying to, we're done with the, with the analysis, and we have to store the artifacts uh, from Meyer and Catholic And we want to store them at the fort, because Fort Vancouver has the facilities to do it. Portland State, as you probably know, doesn't have them, so we can't do long-term storage. And everybody would kind of like them to stay near to, near where, and everybody would very much like them, to stay near where they were excavated rather than going down to Eugene or going, for a case of Capitol, going up to the Burke at the University of Washington, which is where those things are. So to negotiate storage of just Capitol, we have uh, negotiations between the National Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who are both agencies within the Department of Interior, but they have their own lawyers and their own protocols and their own issues. And so they might as well be separate age, separate departments. I was just totally, and of course, Portland State is sort of on the sidelines of this. But we also, um, as part of that negotiation, there are the interests of the Chinook, uh, Grand Rock, and Kalitz, and who don't have the facilities to store them, but they want to ensure that they have access or some, some that the, that, the, that the artifacts don't completely just go out of their their ability to, to, to deal with them. They're, they're in Portland, they could come in PSU, they could be visited and things like that. Uh, when we were talking to the Chinook, one person suggested that maybe we bury half of them, uh, which we can't do, uh, even if we wanted to, we couldn't do it. But anyway, so there's this complicated negotiation in terms simply about where to, where to store them and then how to structure the agreements that they satisfy the legal requirements, the Park Service and the, and the, and the, the Fish and Wildlife Service who are paying the store that they belong to Fish and Wildlife Service. Park Service wants to own and they have to sort that out. And then we have the, the tribal groups who also want to have some kind of access to it, want to be sure of having some kind of access to it. And so it's, it's I started the process in February of 2009 and it's not done yet. <laughs> and I need to get them in stories this summer. So it's, <laughs> so that's complicated. Um, in terms of, in terms of, that makes it harder than it is. In terms of the actual work, that's not part of the actual work, but in terms of the actual work, a lot of, a lot of it is based on person-to-person -person relationships, talking to people and things like that, and going to things at the plank house and those things, those things. And, I'm not, you know, I guess it's political, but I don't think of it that way. I think it is just sort of the ongoing way things things get done, things are done, um, and really in a framework of mutual respect. So the so the politics, the official politics, are kind of because you've got tribal governments, you've got federal government, you've got all that. So that stuff is kind of complex, kind of difficult. The politics that involve or getting things done involved among people is, is it's, it's entangled. It's entangled, which means it's not always easy, but it's, it, it, it works. Somebody once told me, somebody in some other, another context said, well, if we just keep the <clears throat> tribal governments out of it, everything will go fine. And I think that's sort of the way it works. If we just keep the solicitors and the directors out of it, it'll be all right. <laughs> so, so it sounds like developing personal relationships it's has everything. been really key. It's, every, it's key. It's everything. How, how do you teach your students that as you're training archaeologists? You exemplify it. You can't. You say, oh, develop personal experience. You explain you, you know, you, you, know, you have to. You show them how. You, that's the only way you can do it. You can. You have to show them this is how you do that. You can't. You, you can talk. You can lecture about it, but you have to. You have to show them that this is how it's how it works. Are there some key turning points in your own personal history of building those relationships with Native peoples? At some point, I don't. <clears throat> at some point, uh, well, it could have been 
with our relations, like with Portland State, with the Grand Ronde, where we had collections of human remains that were repatriated before NAGPRA was passed. And so, but I think with, with, with the other, I think it's, no, I don't know that there's a single thing. I think it's just an on, ongoing effort, transparent effort, transparency, and in terms of what we were doing, and also simply just accumulating trust. I don't know that there's a terms of turning point, but the turning point would be the, probably the Council Portal Project. It's just simply the, the project itself over the last 20 years and building those relationships in the course of that project. So really building the Plank House, the reconstructed... Well, the Plank House, yeah, the Plank House was a really important event, a uh, series of events that involved uh, several thousand volunteer hours, uh, and it was put up, and it's a modern version of one of the people say it's a replica, it's not a replica, it's just a modern one. Uh, yes, so that was a very important, uh, very important, uh, it also illustrates the difficulties, uh, for example, fish and wildlife safety people got involved late in the process, and a whole series of uh, compromises had to be made on the, on the design to satisfy them to the point that the tribe almost walked, but they didn't because of all of the investment of the people in the local community, the volunteers. They felt like they would be letting them down, so they did something that they were uncomfortable with. Um, you know, they'd like to build one somewhere down at the mouth that's on private land and you know it's just in a completely traditional you know and I'd feel badly because then they would take all of their activities there but so that's another illustration of those of those complexities and then the plank house is a source of controversy uh, the cowlets you know don't like it or they've gotten too happy about it but at first they didn't like it at all uh, uh, one, one called it a sort of an idol on their territory the old, you know, in that sense, so it was the source of, on the one hand, we're doing this thing that we think is really sort of a wonderful thing to do, and they're not happy about it at all. Uh, <clears throat> but on the other hand, subsequently, the Plank House and the events and activities of the Plank House have actually, I think, worked to kind of heal some of that. So.